Today we're going to be analysing an unstamped letter in our rural letterbox by Robert Frost. Usually in my poetry analyses, I will first go through what happens in the poem and then I will break it down line by line. But today I'm actually going to be combining the two just because this is quite a long poem. Um, so it would take quite a long time to do both of those. And because it's long, you don't have to break it down quite so much. It's not as sort of concentrated almost in important moments and complicated words and things that need discussing. So without further ado, let's jump in. Last night, your watchdog barked all night. So once you rose and lit the light, it wasn't someone at your locks. No, in your rural letterbox, I leave this note without a stamp to tell you it was just a tramp who used your pasture for a camp. This poem is written in a letter from a homeless man to a farmer. He says obviously here that the farmer's dog barked all night, but it wasn't because of robbers, it was because he, the tramp, slept in the farm last night. He doesn't exactly apologise for the dog barking or for waking up the farmer, but he is self-deprecating when he describes himself as just a tramp. This presents the idea that being homeless makes you worthless and inferior, and that's something that is going to be explored a lot through the rest of the poem. There, pointed like the pip of spades, the young spruce made a suite of glades, so regular that in the dark the place was like a city park. There I elected to demur, beneath a low-slung juniper, that like a blanket on my chin kept some dew out and some heat in, yet left me freely face to face all night with universal space. Here we get more insight into the tramp's character because he is very optimistic in how he describes his rough situation and how he found comfort in it. So he says that the trees were like a city park and they're also like a blanket. And he describes the blanket as keeping some dew out and some heat in, which is a really clever structural choice because usually in lists, the last thing listed is the one that we focus on. So we can assume from this that the tramp is more focused on the good things that he does have rather than the negatives he doesn't. He also describes how his less than perfect sleeping situation gave him an intimate view of the stars, which is again drawing attention to a positive and being optimistic. Another thing we learn about the tramp is that he's very well spoken, particularly in the line elected to demur. He also makes a pun between suite and suit, as in suit of spades in cards, which is referred to a few lines before that. So again, this shows the tramp's intelligence, contrasting what he previously said about being just a tramp. It may have been at two o'clock that under me a point of rock developed in the grass and fern, and as I woke, afraid to turn, or so as much uncross my feet, lest having wasted precious heat, I never should again be warmed, the largest fire drop ever formed from two stars having coalesced went streaking molten down the west. The tramp is saying here that at one point he woke in the night and he saw a supernova, which is the collision of two stars. Coalesced is again beautiful diction where he could have just said combined or come together. The warmth of the fire drop also contrasts his cold situation, which serves to emphasise how striking and important the star's movement was to the tramp. And then your tramp astrologer, from sea this undoubted stir, in heaven's firm-set firmament, himself had the equivalent, only within. Inside the brain two memories that long had lain, now quivered toward each other, lipped, together and together slipped, and for a moment all was plain, that men have thought about in vain. The supernova triggered in the tramp the collision of two dormant memories, so the stars are a catalyst and a metaphor for the epiphany that follows. Tramp astrologer is obviously quite an unusual description, and it seems somewhat contradictory. This implies that he sees himself as more than just a tramp after all. Then lines 33 to 36 are quite sexual in their description, and I think the purpose of this is because obviously sex creates life. So he's telling us that the realisation related to how he lives his life perhaps gave him a new lease of life. Or it's almost as if he's been reborn as the offspring of this realisation. This sounds really weird. <laughs> 
but I think it's quite an effective way of describing how impactful, I guess, the realization was for the tramp. He doesn't disclose explicitly what the realization was, so he seems to be challenging the farmer and, by extension, the reader to figure it out ourselves. What we do know is that it's about what men have thought about, so perhaps he's saying what we value and focus on are the wrong things. Please, my involuntary host, forgive me if I seem to boast. Tis possible you may have seen, albeit through a rusty screen, the same sign heaven showed your guest. Each knows his own discernment best. You have had your advantages. Things have happened to you, yes, and have occurred to you, no doubt, if not indeed from sleeping out, then from the work you went about, in farming well or pretty well. Now the tramp, having challenged the farmer, is saying perhaps the farmer has already had this epiphany himself through his interaction with nature, so he might have also seen the stars last night and also had the same realisation, or if not by camping out, then through farming and physical work. He describes how the farmhouse is not well kept, it's rusty in its windows, and the farmer does not seem to have much dedication to his job. At least the tramp thinks he does his job pretty well. Then he describes the farmer's advantages, and all of these contrast with the tramp's homelessness, but his obvious intelligence and the hard work that he puts into life. Therefore, this highlights the injustice of the tramp's life when the farmer is better off, but he doesn't seem to work as hard or be as skilled. So the tramp's attitude of not being afraid to insult the farmer is perhaps an expression of his bitterness at this. And it is partly to compel myself in former pauperous to say as much as I wrote you this. Former pauperous is a Latin phrase which again shows that the tramp is intelligent and it means in the form of a pauper, a pauper being a very poor person. Therefore, the epiphany seems to have been about riches and what we value. By the end of the poem, the tramp has discovered that, though he is homeless, this does not define him, and he still has value. So now we've been through the poem, I'm going to draw some attention to some of the different aspects of the poem, or themes of it, or characters, that I think require a little bit more explanation or exploration, starting off with the form of the poem. So the writing style is very formal, it's eloquent, optimistic, modest, educated, conversational, philosophical and reflective. And I think because the tramp is clever with a beautiful turn of phrase but he's also modest and because he's in a bad situation but he's optimistic, he comes across as overall quite likeable and that is really down to the writing style so that's why the writing style is so important. There's also a lot of irony, obviously, that a tramp who we often associate with being illiterate is writing such a literate letter, including speaking in different languages and including all these complex words. But that ties into the whole message of the poem. The last line, in fact, harkens back to this and explains that his position in society, or his former, does not define him. So the form of the poem is a single verse paragraph with equal length lines and it's quite conversational in tone. So these reflect the fact that it is a letter and it's also very flowing and I think that reflects the style of the tramp's eloquent reflection. It's written in first and second person which I think is really effective because it gets across the dynamic between the tramp and the farmer which is basically what all the themes revolve around. These themes of being in nature and social status and value and worth all sort of arise out of the comparison between the tramp and the farmer. But the way that it is written like this gives the tramp centre stage and gives him his own voice, where I think with an omniscient narrative, he might have been pushed to the sidelines in favour of the farmer, who generally people just respect farmers more than they do homeless people. The rhyming scheme is an A-A-B-B -B rhyming scheme with the occasional A-A-A -A -A rhyme. So it's very flowing and rhythmic. And I think that the triple rhymes are not to point us to specific moments in the poem or anything. They're just when Frost felt there was a third rhyme in there and it would flow better. 
So this whole poem is based around this flowing rhythm and as a result it might not be the most strictly ordered and conforming to poetic techniques sort of poem but it is such a pleasant poem to read and I think this reflects how the tramp is a pleasant person. So a couple of the literary devices used, uh, he refers to the senses in when he talks about heat so that immerses us in the tramp situation and the contrast between fire drop and his cold position on the floor. Then the stars are a metaphor for the tramp's epiphany and they're also a representation or I guess again a metaphor for hope, wisdom, inspiration, brightness, truth and realisation. Then there is also a contrast of the ungrateful farmer and the tramp who is intelligent and open to new knowledge and is humble. Then there's also a juxtaposition of the tramp's social status and his eloquent letter, which we wouldn't expect from someone of that social status. And both of these serve to highlight the tramp's value in the face of his social position, which we usually don't consider of much value. Moving on to the tramp, he is the only character who gets a voice in this poem. And I think that's really important because Frost is saying he is the important one. Don't worry about the farmer. This is his story. So, the tramp does not apologise for intruding on the farmer's land or for waking up the farmer in the night or even for insulting his farming skills. But instead, he is initially apologetic for being homeless. And then later on, he apologises for appearing to boast. So we can see from this that he is more interested in overall honesty and character and spiritual matters than everyday inconveniences and his reputation and rudeness. So that gives a picture of him as someone really honest and in touch with a higher wisdom than just everyday knowledge. Then if we look into the tramp story, he is alone and he's isolated, but he finds comfort in the wider universe. He opens himself up to the outside world, which provides answers to his internal questions. He realises he might not be rich by society standards, but he still has value and he can find value in what's around him, in experiencing the natural world, which is arguably better than the dispassionate life the farmer seems to lead. Now let's talk about the main theme of the poem and the main message or moral of it. So originally when I was trying to think about themes in this poem, I was going to split it into social status and then the importance of nature. But then I realised that they sort of come together into one theme because they are basically opposites and they provide a really good contrast between them. And this is a contrast that actually Frost explores quite a lot in his poetry. So looking at the nature side... He is exploring the power of nature to educate and inspire people. The Trump is not someone we'd associate with formal education, yet he is extremely literate and eloquent. His moment of wisdom comes from spontaneous interaction with nature, not from rigorous formal education. So we're really getting an insight into how the outside world can give answers to our internal questions. Then moving on to how he talks about society, Frost contrasts society's norms and expectations around value with the fact that the tramp is valuable despite not having what society considers valuable, which is a formal education and riches. Thus, Frost seems to be discounting society and what society values and is instead advocating a lifestyle more closely knit with nature than with the rules and norms of society. And this is explored in many of his other poems, as I said, uh, particularly Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening and Birches. So I would recommend going giving those a read if you want to hear more on this subject. But for now, I hope you got something out of this analysis of an unstamped letter in our rural letterbox by Robert Frost. That is a tongue twister to say.